My name's Darren Gray. I'm the Group Sales Manager uh, for Hutchinson and Pierce. Uh, looking after this sort of range of preferred compact construction and uh, lifestyle products. So, um, opportunity time, I guess, coming in winter uh, to have a bit of a clinic uh, tonight. So, glad you guys could come out and join us. Uh, at the same time, we're actually broadcasting this live on Facebook and YouTube, so we've got an audience online as well that are um, taking in this as well. So, um, we'll, we've got about 45 minutes um, that we'll try and get through it as, as quick as we can, but at the end of it, hopefully you've learned a lot about what you can do to look after your chain and maximise the performance of uh, your chainsaw as well. So, um, we'll, we'll get straight on into it. So I guess the things that are, we, we sort of want to touch on on that, so um, first we're going to look at just yeah, what does the cutter tube actually do. So we're just going to look at a small profile and see how it actually operates um, in the timber. We'll also have a look at the different types of chains because there's different chains for different applications that you can use. So um, there may be some options there for something that you're doing at the moment that you want to use as well. Um, we'll have a really close look at, I guess, you know, paying attention to the details, so preparation, so trying to identify, okay, we've got a chainsaw that isn't working right, that we need to sharpen, so what's actually the problem with it? So I'm going to give you some tips to, on things to actually look for to um, work out what's going on there. Um, we'll then look at the tools of the trade, I guess, so there's a menagerie of different sharpening tools that you can get as well. So, you know, what's going to be the, the best tool for you um, that you feel comfortable with. And we'll finish up with a bit of, I guess, some technique tips and these. So, some do's and don'ts as far as sharpening because there's some things that you can easily sort of get lost in um, as well. So. so, as far as how it works, um, I guess uh, for a lot of people, old school, if they had an old hand plane and that, they'd be used to to where they adjust the blade on that. So effectively what they're doing is they're adjusting the, the depth of it to determine the chip or amount that it's going to be pulled out. That's basically what a cutter tube on a chainsaw does. So we have a, a depth gauge or a raker, um, as they call it, at the front of it. And then we've got our actual um, top plate. So what the, the depth of that doing is actually determine how much of this plate is actually going to go into the timber and cut. Okay, now ideally that's that's the sort of you know the, the optimum sort of amount that you want feeding in there. Okay. If we get a few things wrong, we might be getting more, we could be getting less, and that will impact the performance of the way that, that it um, that it cuts. The so that's measuring that. The side here is basically you know, what's ripping out the side of the cut to pull it out. So um, as we go through the different types, you'll sort of get to, to understand what that means. I've just got this slide here just as a bit of a, an anatomy of what the chain is as such. So um, one of the things that you'll notice here is these little marks here, and they're quite important on the um, steel chain because they're actually service limits, so it actually gives you a guide of where you should be up to. Okay, so there's actually three different markers, so there's one on the left gauge, there's one there on the, on the top plate, and then there's another one down here. Okay, so at any stage, if you happen to be lower or past any of those marks on one of them, don't worry about sharpening. Okay, it's past the service line, hoist it, get a new chain, start again. Okay. Uh, and you know, reasons for that could be errors in sharpening, it could be just wear and tear, it could be that we've used a damaged chain and we've forced it too much as well that's, that's created that problem. So as far as the different types of chain, um, most people are going to be familiar with two types of chain. So uh, rapid micro or semi chisel, is what the older heads sort of call it, and then you've got full chisel or rapid super. Okay, so um, basically the difference between the two of them is the, the profile of the cutter tool. So whilst the, the angle that we're sharpening at is identical, you can 
see this has like a bit of a rolled off edge on it. Okay, where this one here, when the foot chisel or racket super, is a lot more pointy. So it's, it's going to be a um, different style of cut. So there's an example there where you can see those uh, rounded off there. I'll show you one of these ones here. You can see the, the difference on it where that's sort of rounded off. Okay. So what, what that will mean is because this is more square and pointier, um, it will perform differently. Okay, so again, choosing it for the right application um, is something that you, you need to do. So where would we use a racket micro chain? So this is probably the most common chain that's um, sold around the country because it's you know, on, a, on a occasional user or or farmer's chainsaw on it. So it's designed to, I guess, be a little bit easier to sharpen. It's less forgiving um, if, if you do muck it up to, to some extent. Um, but because it's got that rounded off profile on the side, it's great in hardwood. Okay. Whereas if we're looking at the rapid super or the full chisel chain, that point will mean that it will actually cut quicker. Now, all of Skills Professional Chainsaws are fitted with that Rapid Super Chainsaw, uh, rap, Rapid Super Profile. And that's purely because professional users are using it day in, day out. They're more used to what is required with sharpening in that. So their performance, because their you know, time is money in that, so they, they need optimal performance for what they're doing. So they have that style of cutter to it. Okay? Um, for an occasional user, it's, um, it will still work, okay, now, great in softer timbers in that, uh, it just won't hold its edge as long uh, in harder wood okay, but there's a lot more of a technique to sharpening it, so you've got to be spot on with it when you do it. Um, as far as other profiles of, of chains that we can get, so what I call a conventional chain is cut it to joiner, cutter to joiner, so it just alternates between the two of them. Okay, that's what just about all the chains that you know, most people use, that's, that's what they're going to have. But we do have some other alternatives. So you can get a rapid duro chain. Now, it's a piece of tungsten that is brazed onto the actual cutter to. So where that would be ideal is if you've got some, some um, application where your, your timber's quite dirty. If you're using one of these, either one of these chains, okay? Dirt is the enemy of chains, all right? So you go through, do a cut, and you nick a bit of dirt, she's all over, you'll start having, having problems with it, okay? The rapid duro chain, you've got a little bit more give in that, in that it can tolerate a bit of dirt um, before it will actually start to slow up, okay? Um, but you need, there are specific requirements as well as far as how you look after and maintain that chain also. Okay? Because that cutter tooth is going to last a lot longer, but the reality is it's mounted to a normal chainsaw body. So you've got to make sure that you maintain it as well. Um, some of our professional users may require a different um, style of application. So we have what they call a skip tooth. So instead of it being cutter, joiner, cutter, joiner, we've got cutter, joiner, joiner, cutter. Okay, so what actually happens is that there's less teeth um, that are on the, in, on the chain. So does anyone know where we might use that application? On a mill. Sorry? On a mill. On a mill, yep, exactly. So if you've got, um, you see operators that might have, say, a three foot bar, okay? and they're doing some slabbing or milling, so they're cutting that entire length. If you're using a, a chain like this, um, it, because you've got that whole length of the bar, you've got to get the chips out of it, and it may have difficulty trying to get that all the way out. So what we do is that we reduce the number of cutters that are in there so that it's got more space to be able to pull that through. The other alternative in that as well is a, is a ripping chain. So Again, for that um, milling application, it's very similar to the Rapid Super in that it's square on it, but instead of being that 30 degree angle, 
we're sharpening at 10 degrees. So it's going to be a slower cut, but when you've got that great big length, that's generally what we, we need to do as well. Okay, um, so getting ready to sharpen the shape. I guess the, you know, the important thing is you know, we need to sharpen it, but what, you know, what, why do we need to sharpen it? What's happened? Okay, so I can shout out some examples of what might have gone wrong with the dirt. Hit the dirt, yep. Hit a no, rock. Number, number one, yep. Cut the crooked. Hit a rock. Hit a rock, yep. <laughs> yep. So um, cutting crooked um, is is one of the common things, and that's usually because of one of the other things that have been said, is that you've hit a rock, you've hit some dirt, the chain's gone dull, and things are going wrong. So what we're going to do is we'll just look at some of these... So the biggest giveaway for me when you're using a chainsaw, right, the, the idea of a chainsaw is that you start it up, you put it on the log, you let the chainsaw do the work. All right? If you're forcing or levering it at any stage, it's got a blunt chain. Stop. Okay. Um, I've got the picture here of a sharp chain. So you, when you start cutting and you're looking at your feet and it's covered in really big chips of sawdust and this is really good, okay? Five minutes later, you might look down and it's all powdery. And that's because you've hit something and you haven't got that sharp chain again. So at that point, you probably find that you are levering on it a little bit as well. Stop. Let's have a look at sharpening the chain. Okay. So what happens, as we said, we've got this, this bit here where it's, it's starting to run off and cut crooked. Okay. The other thing is that if we go... Yeah, it's all right. I've only got a couple more cuts to go. I'll just keep going. Um, we call the rule fire service because we've got a bushfire happening. We've got too much smoke coming around. And we have problems like this where the smoke isn't actually from the engine. It's from the bar of the chainsaw that we're just cooking it. So, again, if you're choking on smoke, stop. <laughs> Let's sharpen your chain. Um, the other thing is that you may also have um, excessive vibration. Okay, so if you, it should be just pulling through nicely. There's going to be a little bit of vibration, but if it if it feels like it's chattering, um, there's a problem as well that we need to stop and address. So when we're preparing to sharpen the chain, I guess the first thing that we want to do is clean it up um, because they're they're messy buggers. Um, so clean it up, have a good look at what we're dealing with in the first place because you need to identify what the problem is. The common mistake I, I see with people sharpening chains is that they don't address the problem. They go, I'll just give it three rubs, move to the next two, give it three rubs, and then they go and they start cutting and they go, yep, I've fixed the problem. And then about four or five cuts later, it starts um, performing badly again. And that's because they haven't addressed the, the actual problem with it in the first place. Okay. So it's key that we clean it up, have a good look at it, identify those service limits. So if we're past that, it doesn't matter what else is wrong with it, we've just got to replace the chain anyway. Okay. So um, identifying what's wrong with it. So it could be a problem from the way that we've sharpened it previously. It could be from what we said, we've hit dirt, dust, wire, bolts, whatever else could be buried in timber that's sort of seen it all, um, and it's damaged the cutter too. Um, but we also need to look at the bar, because like I said with that burnt one, there's another example there where someone's decided to run a really loose chain and it's um, created a, it's just chipped away at it, um, so it's not going to perform on that. Um, and, of course, you don't want to forget the sprocket because it's a combination of, of those three things. So when it comes to the angle that you're going to sharpen at, um, I guess there's three things. It's the angle of that top plate. It's the angle that you're filing across at. Um, and the positioning of where the file is because that affects the, the side plate as well. So depending on the style of chain, it's going to be different from chain to chain. So you need to be aware of that. So some things that can go wrong, I guess, with sharpening for a variety of different reasons. 
um, that we'll touch on when we get to the, to the technique. So we're looking at, we want a 30 degree angle here, but this one is quite pointy, right? So that's going to affect the way that it's going to cut. Um, that will actually be faster cutting because it's more pointier, um, because there's less surface angle on it, so it'll get through the ticket quicker, um, but um, it won't hold its edges long. Conversely, we can have this one here, where it's more straight on, okay? You've got more of that cut to going into the timber, so it's actually going to slow it down. This one here is always a, a, a bit of a, a goodie for me. Um, it's what we call hook. So someone's sharpened it by hand, um, and they don't actually have a guide of, of any sort. And what they've actually done is, instead of sharpening the top plate, they've sharpened everywhere underneath it. So you've got a massive amount of hook there. So again, you've got very little resistance, so it'll, it'll hook through there, cut quick, but it's not going to hold that edge long. Same thing, in this case, the fold's up too high, so we've got no angle actually underneath the cutter too. So it will actually slow it down. So it's important that you get all of these elements right. So you can look at those angles, but then it depends as well on are they the same on both sides. So if I've got one that's I do, and the other one which is more straight on, I've got one two who wants to cut nicely, I've got another two that sort of wants to go slower, so consequently it's going to start pulling to the side. Um, the length of the cutter tube will, will be a problem as well if you haven't adjusted the depth gauges accordingly. So we need to make sure that they are in balance together. And then same with those, those side plates as well. So if we've got too much undercut on one side and not enough on the other, it's going to affect the balance of it. And it's the same with the, the rakers or the depth gauges also. So, I guess the easiest way to show it is here, is that this one here, the depth gauge is too high, and this one here is um, probably too low. But then if you marry it up side by side, you're going to have the chain conflicting against one another. So it's going to be quite chattery, and you're going to find that it's going to you know, pull to the side. So we need to make sure that we address those problems and get them right um, to ensure that we get a good sharp. So it was really interesting when I was starting to put this presentation together. Um, I thought, oh yeah, I'll, I'll find all this information online about you know sharpening chains, which there's a plethora of information. But looking for information on dull chains or someone who's Hit a bit of, bit of wire or hit a bit of dirt, no one wants to put their hand up for it. <laughs> so I've got it. I've found a couple of examples in, in the end. So um, here's some here where you can see that the, the cutter, um, what we call, is, is dull. So when you look at the cutter tube itself, the final thing that's done to that cutter tube is that there's a chrome coating that goes over it. That's what gives us the hardness to allow it to cut. When we're going through and we're, we're cutting and we hit that bit of dirt that we knew was there but we thought it would be right, but we still hit it, and it takes that, what it does is it actually peels the chrome back on the, the cutter tool. So you might have this, this one here and you might see like a, a dull mark that sort of starts to appear on the, on the top, top there, okay? So we need to address that, all right? Um, it may well be that you'll see like a like a triangle shape on the side here as well. So same thing, we've, we've, we've nicked the dirt, it's pulled the chrome back and it's just the discoloration of that that has brought it back to the, you know, to the, the bare chain itself. Okay? So the only way we can fix that is to remove all of that. These other examples uh, where we've got, you know, bolts, metal, wire that's been buried in the timber that we haven't seen. Um, that gets aggressive because it, it pulls the chrome off, but it actually affects the, the cutter tube itself. So.
So what I mean by that uh, example there, uh, in fact, here's a great view of one. So in this particular case, you can see where that's peeled back and probably about three millimetre of damage on a cut or two, which is a considerable amount of damage. So I mentioned earlier that um, what we, we can be a bit guilty of is just giving this three or four rubs and it's sort of started to put a little bit of an edge back on it and I'll cut for a couple of cuts, but we haven't actually identified what, what the real problem was in the first place. Okay. So what we have to do is we've got to get rid of all of this in the first place. Okay. So this, I guess, identifying what I call the, the worst cut or two um, is the thing that you need to do first because if everything that we looked at before where we've had inconsistent lengths of cut or two and, and things like that, we've got to get back to a consistent spot to start with. Right? So pulling it back to this, there's going to be a bit of work involved and some of us are just going, I'll just buy another chain. It's not, it's not worth the heartache. Okay? Uh, but if it's the end of the day and you're in the shed, well, maybe you'll, you'll muck around with it. You don't need to get it too. Sorry? Uh, if one is that bad, the other's not. You have to do it or make the same. If one's that bad, they're all that bad. Yeah. Yep. You've got, to, you've got to have that consistency. So they've all got to be exactly the same. Okay. So that's why we've got to identify the, the worst two first because that's basically what we're going to be sharpening back to. And that guide, sorry, that guide mark. Is that you can go all the way back to that? Is it? This one here? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, this, in this case, it's going to come back to here, and then we would adjust the depth gauges accordingly. Because if you look at a, a chain itself, the, ch the tooth itself is actually sloped downwards gently. So, as you sharpen the back, that depth gauge starts to get higher, so the clearance isn't there. So as you sharpen the cut tool, you need to pay attention to the, to the depth gauge as well. So, and it's, it's a problem that a lot of people have, is that they'll, they'll sharpen the tool, have a sharp tool, but they haven't adjusted the depth gauge, so subsequently they're not pulling, like the tool's not going in deep enough, pulling it up in. So the other thing that we, we sort of talked about before was, was the bars. Um, so it's not just the chain, okay? So you could have the sharpest of chain, you could even put a new chain on it. But if your bar has an issue with it, it's still gonna cut crooked. It's still gonna be a problem, okay? So we need to make sure that that's right. Um, you can get a simple tool that you can drop down in the bar and, and clean the groove out with, um, which is handy to have. Um, it also allows you to check the, the depth of the bar as well. But if you've got a problem with the depth of the bar, it'll be a, a pretty quick giveaway because the, the drive link itself, instead of having sort of this curved off area, it'll go flat. So that tells you that it's bottom now. Um, in that case, it's throw the bar away. It's past the service life, get a new one. Okay, so we can start to look at things. So someone mentioned before about you know, the, the rails being uneven and, and burden that on. So you can see here where this one is starting to flare out. So suddenly what happens is that that chain hasn't got the support on in the in the bar itself, so it starts to lean over. So once you get a bit of pressure on that, it's going to start cutting the hook. We've got the extreme examples that we, we sort of said before where we've had bars where they've sort of started to go there, but I've actually got this one where they've actually blown the tip out of it, so they've just drove it into the ground that badly, but what's ended up happening is the chain has actually gone down between the side of the bar and the sprocket wheel, and it's jammed there, and it's just blown it all out, so should, should never have gotten to that stage. Um, so when we start seeing issues with chips in bars and, and dips in bars like that one there, um, it's an issue with the tension of the chain. Right? So the way that we want to tension our chain is that where I'm, I'm sort of picking it up, you 
want to be able to see the bottom of the drive link at the, at the top of the bar there, so it's visible, and it just springs back in. Then it can just turn freely by hand. Okay? If you can't do that, it's, it's too tight. All right? and, if, and if it's pulling up more than that, then it's clearly too loose, and we need to adjust it. So that example of that dip bar there, when you've got a loose chain, you've got all this power on the chainsaw itself, so it's driving the chain around, but as it's coming around, it's actually pulling it in. So you can see where it's starting to move off away from the bar there, but then consequently what's happening is down this end, it's actually pulling into it, so it's actually pulling up, and it just keeps on chipping away at it, and we just end up with this dip in. So it's just a tension issue that needs to be addressed. So with that bar, with the, the excessive wear, there's an easy way of checking out whether it's sort of serviceable or if it's, it's faster than that. So if you get your, your chain and you get just get a ruler, okay? Put it against the, the edge of the, the cutter tooth and then bring it down to the bar. Alright, so if you've got a gap down in here, that's telling you that that's all good, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay? But if we've got one that's warm, what will happen is that when you put that straight edge on it, it leans the chain over because it's got too much weight in here. Um, again, new bar is the, is the, the way that we fix that. Um, I said before that you can have the newest of chains on it and if your, if your bar's uneven then it doesn't matter, it's still going to get it. So you can imagine that one there where the, the right hand side is much lower than the left. Okay, once I start you know, applying the pressure on that, it's just going to cut crooked. Right? It's just going to run up. So um, it's not going to work. Where that's that excessive, again, you're not going to fix that. Um, it's got to be specially ground. But then what's going to happen is you're going to drop the rail down. It's going to get too shallow in the bar, so the drive things are going to run on the bottom. But it's just a, it's a throwaway replacement the joint. If it's only minor stuff that's on it, you can get the, the bar dressing tool. So there's these little tools here that you can run along um, the bar. Um, so that you can sort of take those feathers off it as well. So they're, they're nifty just for touching up and maintaining um, as well. The other thing is look at the tip um, and make sure that there is a little bit of clearance between the, the, the joiner and the, and the end there as well. So if it's got too much wear in it, that's actually going to be sitting right on top of it, which will, is going to cause that issue of blow the bar apart as well. Um, and then finally you want to look at your sprocket. So most sort of farmer, homeowner type style of saws will have what we call spur sprocket on it, but they do get wear in it because you've got to imagine you've got this chain doing 100 kilometres an hour flying, flying around there um, and it does pull into it. Mate. So it does start to get a, a bit of wear in it and if it wears too much, the chain fits into it deeper and it'll catch. So as soon as you go to turn that over, you'll feel that it's quite rickety in the way that it's working. All right? So we need to replace that. Um, on a professional tool, they have what we call the, the, the rim. So it's the same thing, but it's just that because they're using their saw more often, we've got this little ring that just pulls on and off and it's, it's a quicker, more cost-effective replacement for them. Okay? Same thing, they still need to be turned over regularly because it's not supposed to look like that. That's half of it, the other half's gone somewhere because it's split because it ended up just breaking away. All right? So always um, have a look at those. So I guess the, the tip that I can give you in respect to that is that um, a lot of people will use their chainsaw and they'll just just be using a single chain, okay? But if you want to maximise the life of your, your sprockets, um, and that as well, 
you should be running two chains in tandem um, with one another because what will happen is that they, they're all going to wear even enough together. Right? If you've just got one chain, one chain, one sprocket, chain starts to wear, sprocket starts to wear, then you put a new chain on it, you've got a new chain on a worn sprocket. So it may impact on the way that, it, that it's pulling through. So ideally, two chains to, to one sprocket is the way that we replace them. Then when we look at it over the, the length or the, the time of the guide bar, one guide bar will actually last two sprockets, four chains. So, just bear that in mind because you'll, you'll improve the performance that you're getting out of it and it won't cost it. Keep costing you as much on the game. So back to the preparation, we talked about identifying the worst cut to it, okay? So you can get fancy and you can get boomies out and measure it to see which one's the worst. Um, but when you're in the field, it's probably just as easy if, if the chain's off, loop them together back to back have a look at it because you might find that one tooth is, is longer than the other. Okay? The other thing is identifying that mark. So the mark could be on one side. Doesn't matter. Okay, We're going to sharpen that side first because we want to get rid of all of that mark. Then we have to counterbalance that on the other side. <laughs> like that. Yeah. 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 There, there is. Um, basically, what you want to do is get it at the points where the, like where the, the loop is. Okay. And just pour out. <laughs> Magic. Yeah. So okay, it's it's like that. All right. So you, you've got your your end there. Okay. He was a magician, but yeah, grab the ends and just pour out. <laughs> okay, so we're identifying that. The other thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that it's securely clean. Okay, so um, it's good if I'm at home, everything's gone well, we've finished the day, I'm back in the shed, I can have a beer, I can lock it into my vice, uh, okay. But if you're 50 k's out of town, which invariably what happens, and your chain goes blunt and you need to sharpen it, then you need some way of wigging it up. So you've probably got to slap a timber somewhere that's that you cut, that you can mount it to. You get yourself a stump box or have one of those in your kit. So you can bang it in, lock it in there, so you can start sharpening it when you're in the field. Sharpen it on the machine? Yep. Yep. Yeah, because the thing is that... Um, you need to be able to clamp that into something, okay, to, to do it. Yeah. Um, that's actually, I think, the next slide. Yeah, good segue. So, if if you've got a chain that's loose, when you when you want to sharpen it and you push through with the file, what will happen is that it'll start to, to bend up um, and buckle on that. So, ideally, what we recommend is that like the tension that I've got on it there, that's great for when I'm using the actual chainsaw because you need that given it. When I'm sharpening the chainsaw, I'll nip it up a little bit tighter just so that it's firm, so that it takes all of that sort of play out of it. So, um, yeah, make sure you nip it up. Um, unless you've got some way of securing the chain in another way out of the field, yeah, leave it on there and, and do it there. Yeah. Even home, like unless you've got something else rigged up, putting in the vice there is the, um, the best way to do it. Now, we identified the worst cutter tooth that we had, so we want to make sure that we're consistent with the sharpen as well. So, what we do is get a text there and start to sort of you know, mark it up a little bit, then start to do our sharpen of that. Um, you'll soon see whether you've taken enough off in the first place, because you've got the, the bits of red that are left there. Okay, so in this case, we need to sharpen a little bit more. Okay? That's all well and good if it's just a touch-up. But if we've got that example that we had before, all of that's probably irrespective because you're going to be sharpening for a bit to get rid of that mark. So, tools for the job. Um, like I said, there's a thousand different tools that you can get. Um, 
you can start off with the basic um, guide here, which shows you that it's got a 30 degree mark on it, it shows you your side angles. It's awesome to check your depth gauges with, because you can just slip it over the top there and um, check those depth gauges. Okay. Um, the basic file and handle, unless you've got incredible eyesight and hand coordination, um, really you're wasting your time because you've got to make sure that you're getting that 30 degree angle right, you've got to make sure that you're getting that, the, the height of it right, and you've got to make sure that you're going across horizontally as well. Um, there's a lot to go wrong with something like that, but worst case, if you had to sharpen and that's all you had, that's what you have to do, but you're not going to get a good quality sharpen out of it. Okay? Um, we then had the yeah, traditional files. <coughs> our traditional file holder. Um, so these are quite good because um, the guide is specific to, to each size so they don't actually interchange because it sits in and creates a recess so that the file is at the, the ideal height. Okay, so what happens is that one side sits on the depth gauge, the other side sits on the cuddle tube and you've got the right height that you need to be sharpening out. Um, I guess the thing with this type of uh, tool, you've got your 30 degree lines on Okay, so when I'm here sharpening, okay, I've got my, my 30 degree line there. What I, I want to make sure that I'm doing is, is keeping my arm as straight in that line as I can, okay, as I'm filing through. Okay? Because the line is only there and you're pushing, it may be that you're at 30 degrees at that point, but by the time you get to the end, you might be at 25 degrees. So you've got to just be careful with the way that you're pushing through on that to get, to get that consistency. So does that mean you've got to do the depth gauge first then? No. Oh. Can't do the depth gauge until you've done the cutter. Right. Because the cutter, the cutter because it's going backwards. But you said it, it it's, was leaning on the depth gauge one side? Yep. Yeah, it's just getting the, the, <laughs> the height of the file to the right. Um, we need to address the depth gauge afterwards. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a picture there where it shows that um, sitting on there and so it keeps it at the, the right height. But after we've done that sharpen, you need to then get your tool and do your depth gauge as well. Okay, so there's that type of thing there that just will sit on, sit on the top there and then whatever's exposed, you're just going to file off. Okay, the only point to remember with that is that have a look at the profile of that depth gauge and that it's rounded off. Okay, so if you're just filing it flat, you're flattening that off. Okay it will actually start to cause it to chatter. Because what happens is, as that's going through the timber, it's actually rocking back and forth. Okay? So we need that, because that's working as the guide as it feeds the, the top plate into the timber. So file it off that way, and then just round the edge off as well to make sure that it's nice and smooth. Um, some of the other tools that you can get, these were, um, I guess, the traditional tool for sharpening probably about 30 years ago. Um, from an accuracy point of view, they were really, really good because your 30 degrees was locked in, your straight across was locked in, as long as you got your jump of the pipe right, everything was set and done. From a time point of view, it takes a long time to do it because what you needed to do was come back and um, there was some clamps that were on the tube. You had to loosen each, loosen it off every time you sharpen the tube, move it to the next one, tighten it back up, come on, sharpen it, loosen it off, pull it through. So um, I guess there's been a lot of advancements with sharpening um, technology that there's things that make it quicker. Um, 
we've got the old 12 volt um, sharpness as well, which from an accuracy point of view um, are quite good because you've only got a small stunt, so you've got short strokes. So it's easy to get that 30 degree angle on that. Um, the problem is, if you're in the bush, you need a battery to, to hook it up to as well. So if you haven't got that, um, you might be a bit, a bit stranded with that as well. Um, when I talk about advancements in sharpening technology, we've got this device here, which they call a, a two-in-one sharpener. So what this does, it actually has two round files in it and one flat file. So it sharpens the cutter tube, but it sharpens the depth gauge at the same time. So you can see where the rail sits on the top of the, uh, the cutter tube, and there's a rail there also that will sit on the, the next cutter tube. The file is at the right height there, and it's adjusting the depth gauge as we're going as well. So from a, a time point of view, um, it's one of the quickest ways um, to go. From an accuracy point of view, um, they are really good because it actually had four different markers on here for 30 degrees. So this, this piece here is at 30 degrees to start with. So I know that that's my 30 degree marker um, to begin with. Um, and then as I'm following through, there's other checkpoints as I'm going, and then I get to the end and I've got that 30 degrees there as well. So that um, works amazingly well and it's quick and it's really convenient to do. So, sorry? That'd be the best one to use probably. Yeah, out of, out of everything that I've got there, I'll, I'll use this over any, any time. So, I had, my father had a problem with his no brand chainsaw, I'll call it, and this was the best, the most expensive thing on the chainsaw. <laughs> I bought that for him just so it was sharp on the chainsaw. Uh, only one tooth at a time. Yep. But it's actually set up so you've got a, an arrow on it showing you which way you're going. It's showing you a picture of the chainsaw, so it's, I don't know if you can see that there, but here's the way the chainsaw. So this is the side that I'm going to be on. Okay, and then when I come around the other side, basically I'm going to flip that over, around like that, and it's set up to, to do the other side. So, yeah, they, they work amazingly well. Um, like I said, they are the best thing that you could buy from out of any of these tools. That could be the best thing that you could buy to, to sharpen the chain. This is more freehand. From an accuracy point of view, yep, that's going to be more accurate than what that's going to be. But it takes more time because this doesn't depth gauge as well, that doesn't. So, um, still introduced these, I'm going to say about 10 years ago, um, because other manufacturers had them. Um, and they, they couldn't get people to buy them, they just couldn't sell them. They started to bring these things in, and that's the, the go to them now. So, but like I said at the start, it's about finding the right tool for you. So, this might be the right thing for some people, it might be as well. Yes, yep, yep, all the way down to the back of the um, If you have a look later, they're, they're over there. Um, there's a range of them to suit you know, all the different sizes and that. Um, if you want to buy one tonight, there's a special on all the chainsaw accessories where you get 10% off. So, like we're saving, saving a bit of money on the night, Do you change the 
Oh, yeah, yep, so it's just got a little little latch there. And then the then the files will come out. You just gotta be careful with the files that you get. So obviously we've got the, the right files for it. Um, in that they actually um, turn in there as well. If you get a different file, um, it might have a longer tail on it and it actually locks. So then it's just sharpening in, it's wearing in one point. So you've got to make sure you've got the right file that turns around in as well. Um, okay, uh, we're just about done. So from a technical point of view, um, there's not too much to do with this stuff that we have already touched. So the critical thing is sharpen from the inside of the tooth out. Okay? Don't go back and forth. Okay, because if, you, if you're doing that, you're dragging filings back in uh, and you won't get that quality sharpness. So only file uh, in the one direction, and it's the same, obviously, when you change sides, you've got to be able to do that as well. Um, maintaining those angles, so a 30 degree angle is going to work best for our rapid super, our rapid micro chain. Um, if you've got a rapid micro chain, Okay, we're going to be sharpening straight across. If we've got a rapid super chain, this is where I was saying earlier on that there's a lot more of a science to it because you actually have to drop the, the angle by 10 degrees. Okay. Now, out of all these tools, there isn't anything that really able to drop it by 10 degrees, so you've got to sort of guess what that is. But whatever you do, you need to be consistent. Okay. So what you're actually doing is sharpening upwards on it. So if you have a look at the cut two, if you have a close look at um, rapid super two, on this plate here, it's at 60 degrees. As it moves across, it's actually getting closer to 90 degrees. Okay? So that's because that is quite pointy on that bit. So you've got to, be, you've got to maintain that. Um, the height of the file, so if you didn't have some guide, you usually want about a quarter of the file being exposed at the top. Um, we've actually got a little goodie bag um, today as well, and it's got a number of different um, sort of brochures and that in it. I've got an older style bar and chain manual that has got a lot of this stuff in it, but um, there's also a checklist that's still put together. Um, in a catalogue that's available over in the US, so they don't actually have it here in Australia. But I thought it was a great um, checklist to, to sort of run through on that, so it gives you a lot of things to, to consider. Um, if you go online, Google Sharp and Steel Chainsaws um, PDF, you can find that document easy enough, um, and you can download it and you can look at all that information. So I guess that's it for me at this stage. So we looked at we looked at a lot of different things, I guess. So we looked at how the cutter tooth works in the first place, all the different styles of cuts uh, as well. We looked at what we had to do to prepare for us. So what were some of the sharp problems we might have had, where might there be damages, so what are the things that we've got to address. We looked at all the different tools of the trade that we've got that we can use, um, and then some of the techniques um, as well. So does anyone have any questions at this stage? Yeah. With the files, like the round ones, got to be the right one for your chain. So what about the flat one? Are they sort of universal or are they different? Yeah, they're, they're universal. Except in, in that, it's a special design one because it's it's more of a, a flat file is normally you know, quite flat, I guess. Um, this is more sort of box um, in, in the way that it's designed. But again, we've got them there. So when you buy that, Three yep. Yep. You can just any of them are readily, readily available there. So, so does the same tool hold different files? Or is there different tools? Different, Di different, different ones for different sizes, yeah. So it actually has on here, you know, what the size is. Um, because those rails are adjusted for all the different types of chain um, as well. So if if you've got multiple chains to different size chains that you want to sharpen, then yeah, you need to get um, uh, different tools, unfortunately. Alrighty, um, just before we go, we got any online questions? Uh, uh, 
No, no online questions, it's good. So um, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to move outside. We've got a demonstration by the Rural Fire Service. Um, so they're going to show us some, some of their techniques and the way that they operate in the field. Um, I'll give you some tips on that. Um, yeah, Barbie's going, so grab a, grab a sausage sandwich or
got to see a little display of the old and the um, we are the next so we now operate by work in the biogram. So it's everything from the next line, like the uh, biogram cutting work or what we call cross cutting or trim trim falling trees that's all work on the fire ground that we use when you've got timber on a trail or burning timber if you've got to cut a log open to get water in it to get things out the main thing is in any um, any operation on the fire ground is all about safety so you see the kit that both the fellas have got on. They've got the lock, locks wearing a, um, a pair of pants, so the full full pants, the chaps, um, or sorry, the chainsaw pants. Andrew's wearing the chaps, the steel cap, uh, for the leaf protection. Um, you'll notice when they're both operating the straw, their hand positioning. If the chain breaks on, they'll take one hand off the saw, while ever the chain break is on, and the saw is in operating mode, Two hands on the saw at all times. So you've got one hand on the on the front handle, and then you've got the second hand on the on the trigger throttle handle on the back. battery saw you see there is currently the most powerful battery saw on the market. It still has, it still has on the market, but the most, the most powerful out of all the, um, the major saw manufacturers. Cutting time, like as in operating time, memory serves me correctly is 45 minutes that's that's full operation time so you can do a fair bit of cutting in 45 minutes Thank you. 
the little square or the little um, block that Andrew just cut out of the log then, that's a technique we use in training. We do that and also we cut triangles, simply so that if we've got a tree that's on fire, a hollow tree, we can cut a hole into the tree, block up any holes at the base and then fill the tree from the base up with foam. It's very hard to put a tree out when it's burning internally from the top because all the, um, all the shingles and shales inside the tree, the fire gets up in behind them, the water running down from the top goes straight past. But if you pump the foam in from the bottom, it'll put the fire out from the base up. Just to give you that, that's a little um, uh, juicy one, the sort of an Andrew has, a little 50cc tall. We run that and we run a 462.
if it was in a cave, it wouldn't be as sharp as that one. I saw a guy doing this one year, competitively. And then come out and got it pretty clean.
are the most revered, dominant, successful, and fear-inducing team in the timber sports world. Their success is nothing short of legendary. And it's a new world record, 46-49. Comprising the best skilled timber sports athletes in Australia, they are committed every time they lift back, every time they raise a saw, or every time they hit the stage. They are focused and committed to a single common goal, winning gold for Australia, and nothing less will satisfy their appetite. Ladies and gentlemen, Brad Delos, everyone. So that was just a, a little recap of some of the things that Brad's been through um, as, a, as a part of the Australian team. Uh, but he's also got a number of individual honours as well. So he's been Australian champion a number of times, been world champion as well um, in individual honours. So he's been doing this for a long, long time now. So when did you first start, mate? Yeah, first started in timber sports in 2003, I went over to the US, so I've done a lot of you know, local competitions and regional shows throughout New South Wales, and um, you know all the all the royal shows, and then yeah, seen it on TV, um, and wanted to go over to the US and have a crack, so yeah, 2003 was the beginning. Okay. So I went to the US, and those of you who, who have seen some of this stuff before, you'll know that the Australian and the Kiwis actually stick it to the US, and we actually got barred from their competitions. So... Um, what ended up happening was the end result of that was a world championships. And that, again, is where Australia has dominated uh, for a number of years now. So as far as your sort of daily regime, like people think of a traditional axeman as sort of being a bit of an athlete like yourself, but you sort of look a little bit more sort of chiseled than I do. What, what What's the daily workout for you? Yeah, I leave into competition. I do quite a bit of training. So I try to do as much chopping as I can, but obviously you can't chop lots all day and you know, too big a pile of wood. So I do quite a bit of swimming as well as, you know, some a lot of cardio work and some light weights. So just depending on each competition, it's sort of slightly different training. So I um, won the um, Australian Trophy, which is like an endurance type event rather than just the individual event. So about a month ago over in, uh, in Adelaide, and that's uh, qualified me to go over to Vienna in a few weeks. So... Uh, that event is, um, you cut one disc with the um, MS661 still stock saw, you run across, you cut an underhand, you come back to the single buck saw, and then finish with the standing block. So for that particular event, I do a lot more cardio work than what I do for the traditional tennis sports series. So as you've seen on the video there, that was the team stuff where one person done those individual things. In this actual event, it's endurance, so Brad does it all himself. Um, and it's a series of knockouts. So there's 16, 16 qualifiers. So it goes through knockout all the way through to the finals. So Brad's got history in this event in winning it. So uh, we're all going to be watching online at the end of the month, uh, hoping that Brad comes through again, uh, another world title. So Yeah, that's certainly the plan, Darren. Hopefully on the yeah, 28th of May over in Vienna. So I'll leave on the 18th and fly out. I'll go over to the Netherlands, do a training camp over there for about three or four days and then um, yeah, head across to Vienna. So... Yeah, as you said, I've been lucky enough to win this um, this world trophy on uh, on three occasions. So you you win a ring, which I've got some rings displayed over there in front of the chainsaws. So yeah, 2014 was the first time I, I won it in Budapest in Hungary, and then um, Florence in 2015, my seven year world record, which still stands today over there, 57.59 seconds, and then also in um, Hamburg was the last one in 2017. So it's been a a uh, long while between drinks, COVID, and a few other losses I had along the way and didn't qualify. But um, yeah, we're really looking forward to getting back over there this year and uh, competing in this format again. Very good. So, what Brad's going to do is he's going to give us a bit of a simulation of some of the things that he goes through. Um, we're going to have a little bit of 
crowd participation as well. Um, might be able to give Brad a few tips in his final hit out before he, he flies out. So, um, and what we'll do is that we're going to finish up with the hot saw over there. So, for anyone who hasn't seen the hot saw before, um, put your fingers in your ears um, it's, and don't blink because it's going to be over really, really quickly. So, you want to talk about the hot saw now or you want to do it later? Yeah, I'll just talk about each individual event. So, um, first of all, I'll, I'll demonstrate an underhand here. So, Darren will get a couple of uh, volunteers out of the crowd just to give you a bit of a hand here. But um, the axles that we use are all all slightly different ground for different uh, different timbers. So the, the wood we use in steel timbers products is poplar. So it's, it's quite soft wood. There are different species of poplar, but it's um, yeah commonly used throughout all the, all the timber sports series throughout the world. Um, here with different traditional wood chops over here, we usually use eucalypt wood. Say Sydney Royal Easter Show was only a few weeks ago. We cut um, silver top ash down there, which all comes usually down around the south coast as well. So uh, for the different timbers, you prepare your axes differently. So. This, this particular axe here is, is ground for poplar, so if you can see there under the light that it's got like a big radius around here like that, which is what we call a banana grind. Traditionally, if you're cutting hardwood or something, that would have a, a bevel around there, which you see on most axes, and that's a more of a traditional grind for hardwood. If you put a protractor over this axe, this would be about 13 degrees, the thickness of this here, whereas a hardwood axe would be 17 or 18 degrees. So if I was to use this axe like at Sydney Show or in some part of wood, it just destroy pieces and break out of it. So there's a lot of science in the axe. You can use whatever size axe you like, um, customise your handle and to the length or whatever diameter you want. The um, Usually, you know, a bigger axe you'll use in softer wood, a smaller block and a smaller axe just for, for the weight and also like sort of like push a knife, uh, a knife into butter, you know, the, the wider it is, the harder it is to get in. So that's usually just a little bit of a background on the um, on the axes we use. So anyone got any questions on that? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we also use um, the cross-cut saws, which I'll give you a little bit of a rundown on this. So this is what they call a peg and raker. Saw. So you've got the cutting teeth here and then the rake pulls it out. So these have been developed, um, come a long way from the old saws you used to see the guys using in the bush, which was an M tooth saw, which is just got a little M tooth and, and no, no rakers like this. Uh, harder wood, like I said before, some guys still use a M tooth saw, but the, um, the peg and rakers are you know, much advanced now compared to what they were a long time ago. This one here has got four little cutting teeth, so it's what they call a four cutter. You can usually have four, three or two. Um, once again, two is, is um, usually better for hardwood, and three or four is probably for your softwood. So you have this, you can have this any length. Um, you can set it up similar to a chainsaw. You can change the rakers to depending on how you know how strong you are and how, how much wood you can cut on the, on the back of the fourth stroke. So there, um, you know, I don't muck around with these, the, the sharpening or anything of these. It's a real science in that. Uh, they vary, you know, in, in price from sort of three and a half thousand to about five and a half thousand dollars each. So quite expensive then your axes you know are around eight hundred dollars like to come ready to go prepared like that. There's quite a few different guys that make axes. Um, that one there is engineered for axes they're made down in Woodend in Victoria. Um Totari are another brand they're made over in New Zealand. Um, and yeah a few others I, I personally use all these ones now they're, they've come a long way and they're probably the best in the market. Um, saws are made um, by Mopal Totari as well in New Zealand and a few other guys in Canada US make them, but they're yeah, very specialised tools. So I'll talk about the hot saw in a little while. We'll get these underway. Okay, so you want a couple of volunteers to start with? Yeah. I'll have a couple of volunteers. Okay. Who would like to volunteer? What are we volunteering for? Oh, it doesn't matter. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Your fingers will be safe. <laughs> Come on. Nothing right. Come yeah, on down. Okay. Come on down. You can be the guinea pig for everyone else, and then they'll want to jump in. Looks like you need to shave. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, I just want you to have a guess how many hits it's going to take for you to get through that. Twelve? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> there we go. By the way, on the Kiwi page, you've been on the video. You see what we did to them on the video? <laughs> <laughs> we had an off day. <laughs> Five, six, seven. Oh, 
Carlos. Thank you. So, Brad, incidentally, the guy's just done half a half a cut there in 20 seconds or so. Um, world record time for the lot? Yeah, the world record, the world record for that is 9.4 seconds. So, I'm going to start with the record with 11.4. So, I don't want to too far off, actually. The boys done pretty good for their first game. So, Brad's obviously been doing it for a while. Yeah, no, there's a technique in that, and as you've seen, um, how they have that big jag up towards the bottom, it's yeah, really important to keep the saw straight all the way through, all that does happen, so no, they weren't very good, it's just, as you get to the bottom, there's less of the saw on the roof, so it's not easy to cut the jag, which is, which is what I'm doing, so you've just got to make sure you concentrate all the way through. Where can we buy one of those swords? Okay, so hot saw. Um, Conventional chainsaw, uh, let's say an MS661, about seven and a half kilos. Um, to cut a log like this, to do a down cut, an up cut, we'd probably be looking 12, 13, 14 seconds, something like that. Um, what's in this, mate? Yeah, so this is actually a 325 Rotex, this engine. So um, in the hot saw event, we have uh, six inches of wood, so you get 15 centimetres, and you've got to make three complete cuts, so you've got to go down up, back down, and start the saw within that time also. So these machines, as you can say, as you see, hot saw, um, they are heavily modified. Um, <laughs> I think it's fair to say they're extremely volatile as well. Yeah, don't say that'll stop playing up on it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, they, <laughs> they are very volatile. Yeah, uh, reliability is a big thing. So, you know, obviously with any engine, the, the more you work it and the hotter it is, the... Um, the less reliability you get out of it. So in this event, it's very important that it starts first pull because the saw is actually not going when we start it. So as I said, that's out of a snowmobile, that engine. So it was um, three three cylinders and they've been separated down just to one cylinder. So it's um, just direct drive uh, straight off the crank. You've got no chain brake, anything like that. Um, as you know, sprockets and sizes, that's 404 um, chain that we run. There's a 72 sprocket on that. So it's about 75 millimetres diameter, so and about 270 kilometres an hour chain speed. So very powerful, about 65, 70 horsepower they put out. And <clears throat> there's no real rules, only single cylinder pull start. So you can have um, a size of whatever you you know whatever you like, but if you get any bigger than sort of 350, 380, uh, you start having a lot of problems to control the saw also. So this one here um, came from the US. That one over there is a 300 cc. This one's 325, as I said, um, both from the USA. So this one's been, um, I've had this one on the Australian circuit. Uh, did have the Australian record with 603, 6.03 seconds for, for the three cuts. Um, and it's just, yeah, got beat me. guy beat me from Victoria with uh, 5.97. So hopefully uh, next round I can um, play my back. So when we say it's volatile when it comes to individual titles and that, this is generally the last event. Um, it's when all the pressure is on, and I've, yeah, when a saw doesn't start, um, things start to get really nervous. So, um, invariably, what happens is that the competitor gets the call. They've got one minute to warm up their saw, so they're praying like God that this machine starts first pull, because if it doesn't, the crowd sort of, Ooh! and then you start. Shit yourself, I guess, <laughs> and start to panic a little bit as far as well. What are we got to do to get this thing going? So, um, because then you need to get the saw going, but then you need to shut it down, refit the uh, the rewind rope, 
um, to it as well and have it all prepared so that when the starter says hands on the wood, you're ready to go because you've only got six seconds to make or break it. Yeah, that's it. So you run through pretty much the procedure Darren said there. We, um, there's a line drawn along the top of the log, which all your fingers have got to be over that line. So there's cameras and everything on you. So if your fingers are, you know, if you're trying to get a sneaky start, you pull your hands down a little bit, that's a disqualification. Um, and you get the one minute to warm it up. So if you can't get your saw warmed up, going, ready, you know, turned off, everything's set, ready to go, and your hands back on that wood in, um, in that one minute, you can either then just go through the motions of the gun firing and then try to re-ruck your saw and, and get it going within a certain time, or you get a disqualification too. So um, with the with the main series, it's, uh, it's six disciplines. So we, we start off with the um, with the underhand, then we do the stop saw, then the standing block, and the springboard, we put the boards in, go up the tree, then we do the single buck, and we always finish with the hot sauce. So over them six events, you accumulate points in each in each event, and then whoever finishes with the most points is um, is the overall winner. So it always comes down to the hot sauce, because it's very competitive, and all the guys are pretty close on points all the way through the day. So, yeah, so it's sort of, you've got to have nerves to steal to pull off a good cut at the end of the day to, to finish it off. So I'll, um, I'll give this a, a start. I'll give it a little bit of warm-up. Just talk to it nicely so it starts for me. And um, I'll warm it up, just go through the motions. As Darren said, it will be quite will be quite noisy. So um, if your ears are a bit sensitive, just block them. Um, I'll warm it up, then I'll get the hands on the wood and I'll just um, I'll go through the, the three cuts like we would in, in competition. Okay, I'll get out of your way and let you get set up. Someone have to stop what's on that. I think it's a new world record. Right? <laughs> 
<laughs> so there you go, you can see how noisy that is and how quick that can happen as well. So um, when we're in the height of competition and that, we're talking about fractions of seconds that can make or break the World Championship. So fortunately for the title that Brad's going over to compete for in a couple of weeks' time, this one isn't in it. So. Yeah, it's always a bit better when you have a low bit on sort of in the competition. But um, yeah, as you can see, they're quite an impressive machine and they run well, so it took a little while to get a bit of fuel up there, but uh, yeah, it ran very well. So yeah, feel free, I'll be um, floating around, I'll put that over there if you've got any questions or anything like that, uh, coming over to chat. Yeah, so we did have one other question, they wanted to know what fuel are you running in it? Yeah, it's just a high octane 109, it's a BP race fuel called MS 109. Yeah, it's not yeah, there you go. It's not it's not Rocket ship. All right, so if you've got questions, Brad's going to be here for a while, so feel free to come in and see him and, and have a chat. Um, otherwise, if you want to know more about sharpening and, and maintaining your chainsaw, we're going to rip back in and do another another session on that as well. So happy days. Thanks, everyone.